Hi, my name is Tom Nesbitt, and I'm while they're passing out the little handout, uh, let me first thank the Yellowknife Dene First Nation for um, welcoming us to their traditional lands, as well as ENR for um, hosting and asking me to take part in this gathering. So I'm a, a lawyer, lawyer, mediator, uh, planner, and the chair of a couple of boards that took the Nuret National Park Management Board since 1998 and the Sayo Management Board since 2008. And um, I'm going to try to bring that perspective, a practical perspective to this discussion. Um, let, me, let me begin with uh, a perspective which the elders of Delne have given us in the Great Bear Lake Management Plan, so-called Water Heart, a management plan for Great Bear Lake. In that plan, the elders' vision um, illuminates all of the chapters of the plan through, through elders' stories. So, a group of people comes upon a huge stone. They must somehow move the stone. It blocks their way utterly. They're unable to go around it, over it, or under it. Nor can they move it working individually or in small groups. They will only be able to move the stone, the elders tell us, if they wor work on it together, each according to his or her role in the larger task. Only the truth discovered by people working together can move the stone and establish a road for all humanity. This is a story which the elders of Delny have given us. Uh, so my purposes today are to introduce this thing called consensus agreements, or some people call collaborative um, governance, and to ask us to think about whether these kind of agreements are applicable elsewhere than, than where they are right now. So what, first of all, is a, is a consensus agreement? By that I mean, it's, it's on the first page there, uh, an agreement or alliance between indigenous authority and the responsible protected area government authority. They are the parties to these agreements. They agree together to establish and oversee the protected area, which is typically a very important part of the indigenous authorities' traditional lands and almost always arises from, in my experience, always from indigenous initiative. They agree to, the, the two parties agree to make decisions by consensus according to agreed or negotiated purposes and the affirmation of Aboriginal or treaty rights. They agree to do this primarily through a management board uh, established for the protected area that advises both parties and acts at least implicitly in the public interest. They agree, they agree to bring party authority to the management board's deliberations and tables for practical day-to-day -day management decisions at those tables. They agree to a party-based dispute resolution process, and all of the foregoing are subject to existing legislative and constitutional authorities. So that's what I mean by a consensus agreement. There are several of these now, which have been implemented and tested over time and proven there that they, that they work. Of course, the one that many of us are familiar with is the uh, Guayanas Agreement established in 1993, the Tukinoid Agreement was established in 1996, uh, the Sayo Dacha Agreement, uh, 2008, and more recently, um, the Adesia Agreement, which uh, Dati just described, and uh, the Taitanayani Agreement, which um, Steve just described. So I want to suggest that these agreements are an emerging model or, or paradigm of future protected area agreements. All these agreements are unique, they all, they all differ. But from my perspective, um, as, a, as a lawyer, but I'm no longer practicing law, um, they are converging in, in uh, a way which is worth really looking at carefully, and that's why we're having this discussion now. So let's look at these agreements um, a little more carefully and more, in more detail. Um, the parties are, are an indigenous authority and, and a, a protected area management authority. And they agree to work together to establish and permanently protect a place and be together responsible for its management, but subject to existing legislative and constitutional, including Section 35 type authorities. They commit to managing this place by consensus, primarily or initially through a, uh, 
a, a management board. That consensus runs in three dimensions. First, bo the board works by consensus. Second, at the board's um, uh, tables, the board and party representatives work by consensus. And third, if there's a dispute, the parties agree to work by consensus. So dispute, especially in more modern, or more recent agreements like the, the Deji Agreement and Tai and Tai Nene, um, there's this extensive dispute resolution process built into the agreements. And it's only after exhausting that consensus process that either party may act unilaterally. So this is a, they're, they're, these are really um, alliances which go to equity, a much more equitable relationship between indigenous authorities and, and, and government, fairness, a healthier relationship between those two, those two bodies, and a contribution to rec reconciliation. Those are the underlying purposes of these agreements. So the essential elements I really want to focus on, here, just stress here, are first, consensus, importing the indigenous tradition of consensus decision making into these areas, second, a management board, and third, party authority at the table. We often hear, and, and we must, when we draft these agreements, we must say that these boards are advisory. We must say that because otherwise we're opening the entire system to third party challenges that a minister has illegally fettered his or her discretion. But that's only, and, and many people see that, and that's the end of their thinking, I guess. But that's one part of a functioning system which goes together with this commitment to consensus decision making and bringing party authority to the table so that even though a board is advisory to a minister, the minister's representative at the table can agree and we have a, we have a final decision there at the table, not in some future uh, time. And this is, this is really important because in my experience working in this field for about 30 some years, uh, that gap between management boards on the one hand, whether established by these agreements or by land claim agreements, that gap between those boards and ministers is really a source of conflict um, and frustration. And here we have an opportunity to overcome that conflict. So they agreed to, to take part in consensus decision making. I'm going to talk about consensus as I learned it from Billy Day and Uvialu Gelder and the elders in Delaney. And as consensus as we've implemented in the Tukunurit National Party Management Board and the Sayodacho Management Board. So consensus is basically a, a systematic process of group decision making that seeks to give all participants a space to speak to hear each other, to hear each di these different perspectives, and to weave these perspectives together into one coherent, consistent whole. It has a slower cadence, it's like a, piece of, a slower piece of music, a more reflective piece of music, where parties agree to find consistency, to reconcile these different perspectives. Reconcile means make consistent, or find the conditions under which things can be made consistent. So. In, these, in this consensus process, we're involved in trying to find the conditions under which these different perspectives that come to the table can be made consistent with each other. It's not a vague majority decides type of thing. Let me, let me illustrate it over here. Um, I want to contrast two things, a realm of reflect, reaction and a realm of reflection. We all hear things we react immediately. We say things, we do things, which we often later regret. People who research our, our, our brain tell me that um, this, we, we hear something and we react. The amygdala, the ancient part of our brain, reacts in six milliseconds, six one thousandths of a second. And it can short circuit the rest of the other, more, the more creative, uh, analytical, um, reflective parts of our brain because it acts so fast. So in consensus, this process is given to us 
uh, very generously by the elders of NWT and Nunavut, in consensus, we have a chance to pause, to slow it down, and to reflect. In consensus, we create this red thing as, as a space for reflection, a space for people to work together in a, in a, ref, in a, respective, in a re respectful uh, way. So typically, it's a systematic process, but it isn't like cooking cutters, but there are different, again, this is like a piece of music with different parts to it. Um, and this piece of music has several elements to it. This, this, kind, of, this, this uh, kind of thought has various elements. We, what, are the, what, are the, what are the issues that have come before the board? What positions are pretty bringing? We then reflect on what are the underlying interests? What are people trying to accomplish in any particular situation? This is a very reflective process which takes time to elicit those interests. We need to look at things from various perspectives. Um, I'm fascinated as, as a chair or co-chair of these two boards how different the perspectives always are which enrich the discussion. I never know what's coming at us, uh, but we always um, are able to stand back, try to hear each other, and, f and find common understanding of these different perspectives. Sometimes even different worldviews are so different. That process is very different than the process of identifying what are our options here anyway then. Again, that process is very different than the process of assessing those options against our interests and making decisions. So what I want to suggest here is the elders have given us this fascinating, holistic way of looking at things and making decisions together. Typically, the chair or the facilitator at the end of any discussion, the chair introduces it, asks questions, and listens. The participants speak. We turn it round and round until we've sufficiently come to some kind of consensus. And then chair typically says, okay, I hear you saying this, 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 and this. Those are the elements I see of this consensus. And then it's for the members to verify that those are indeed the elements of the consensus. The, the, the chair assembles that into one coherent whole and that is verified in the next meeting by the, by the participants. So I want to just make a couple of things about these different perspectives that come to the table. We sometimes create mental partitions. We have to overcome those partitions. Um, we have roles that people are given. Somebody is given the role of a site manager or whatever. Sometimes you have to disassemble that understanding. There's no fettering here. Consensus is built by the parties and the board together. The chair is impartial. And we always go back to shared purposes which were negotiated during the agreement. Those are our compass as a board to go back to a simple statement of shared purposes. Now, Herb's going to come up here and say his bit too, I think. Great. Thanks, Tom.